All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those, if it's your first time tuning in, we bring science, exploration, adventure, and conservation live uh, into classrooms around the world. And since uh, many schools have closed, we have been broadcasting live into the homes of families, of parents, of educators, students, uh, all across North America, oftentimes three to four live events a day. So just tuning into YouTube, I can see there's a large crew already talking in the chat. Excited to get to know everybody. So introduce yourselves in that chat sidebar and start sending in questions when the time comes. We are going on a little virtual field trip today. We are heading uh, to the Duke Lemur Center. So founded in 1966 on the campus of Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. It's the world leader in the study, care and protection of lemurs, Earth's most threatened group of mammals. So we're heading out into one of the lemur forests. We're gonna meet some amazing species of lemurs, learn all about their ecology, and their habits. We are gonna meet Megan McGrath, Education Programs Manager at the Duke Lemur Center. Megan, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hi, yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, so really quick, I wanna explain the mask. Um, since lemurs are primates, albeit distant relatives, everyone who is working here at the Lemur Center, whether we're gonna be six feet from another human or six feet from another lemur, we are gonna be wearing the mask. So I hope you can hear me okay through it. Oh yeah, sounds great, Megan. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and do you all a favor and switch my camera view because I know you did not come here to see me. There we go. So right now we are out in natural habitat enclosure number two. And as you can see, we have some cockerels shafak that are joining us. And oh, right there, we have mom. So this is Gisela and that is her baby Didius. Now, Didius is, ooh, I want to say about three, five months old. Oh, he's getting a little big for riding on mom. <laughs> so Didius is five months old um, and he is hanging out there on mom's back while she eats breakfast. So I'll take a little moment to introduce everyone who lives out in this forest. And then I'll talk a little bit more about what they're eating for breakfast this morning. So we have Gisela who is mom and then Didius riding on her back. and leaning over to steal some of her breakfast this morning. And then over here, we have dad Rupert and big sister Furia hanging out, eating together pretty nicely right now. And those are all cockerels, shafak, a very special kind of lemur that lives on the West Coast in deciduous forest, just like the forest that's around me right now. All that means is the leaves fall when the seasons change. Um, and then over on the other side, we have two more species of lemur. So this one right up here, I'm sure everyone will recognize. We have some ring-tailed lemurs out here. And ring-tailed lemurs, I like to joke, are the poster child for all of the lemur species. Most people think of ring-tails when they think of lemurs. And then joining in near the ring-tailed lemurs, we have some red-fronted lemurs. So right down there, we have Cardinal, he's the male. You can tell he's the male because this one species out here is what's called sexually dichromatic. So he's got a little red forehead, hence the red fronted name. He's chewing on a lemur biscuit or a primate biscuit right now. And then up a little further in the back is his mate. That is Red Bay back there. Um, so she is the female of the pair. So we have three different species living out here. And each of the species eats slightly different things out in the wild because they're found in different areas. For example, ring-tailed lemurs over here are found all the way hundreds of miles away in Madagascar in the southern spiny desert, spiny forests. Whereas the cockerel shafak just across the way are from hundreds of miles north of there on that northwest deciduous forest on the coast there. So. These guys would live in totally different areas in Madagascar, but they get along really well out in the forests here because they live on two different levels of the forest usually. So where you live is not just a matter of where you are physically on a map. It also can be where in that spot do you live. So if it were a little mole living underground, that animal just needs to have space underground. But if we're looking at an animal like a cockerel shafak, they live kind of in the middle of the forest up high. So they don't live quite at the top of the forest. They don't live quite at the bottom. They live kind of in that middle space of the trees. 
Whereas the ring-tailed lemurs, right over here, they spend a lot of time on the ground. You can actually see a couple of them are hanging out on the ground right now. So these guys are the most terrestrial of the lemurs, terrestrial meaning earthbound, spending time on the ground. So they spend about 50% of their time on the ground, even all the way over in Madagascar. But here at the Duke Lemur Center, they spend even more time on the ground because they don't have to worry about predators out here in the forest. We make sure that nothing like a coyote or a bobcat could get in here. And they don't have a flusa here in North Carolina, so we don't have to worry about that either. The flusa is the main predator of lemurs over in Madagascar. So before I get into what everybody's eating for breakfast, I wanted to check and see if we have any questions yet. You there, Joe? I'm not sure if it's my connection or yours, but I'll just go ahead and talk about what everybody's eating for breakfast then. So over here, we have one of our ring-tailed lemurs snacking on primate chow or primate biscuits. So just like they have dog and cat food that is specially made for the animals that some of you might have at home, we have the same thing for lots of animals that live in zoos. So you can find everything from flamingo food to rhino food to lemur food. And so you can see this is a sort of biscuit shape. And we actually have to soak it because it's very, very hard when it arrives, a little too hard for lemur teeth. So it's soaked in a little bit of warm water to make it a little easier to eat. And then they get all the food they need. It's kind of like a granola bar or a meal replacement bar. It has all the food that they need right there. They're switching places. We just had a female go over and displace a male out of her favorite spot, which is her right as the dominant female. Um, so you can see snacking on these biscuits, they definitely enjoy these. Now, if these guys were not living out in the forest this summer, they would also be getting fruits and veggies today, just to help round out their diet, make their meal a little more interesting. But this family gets to live out in a forest full of mulberry trees and blackberry bushes, some mulberry, um, not mulberry, muscadine grapevine. Um, there's also things like red bud flowers or other flowers to eat and snack on. So these guys get plenty of extra food just from the four acres or so of habitat surrounding them right now. So we don't have to give them all those extra fruits and veggies. In fact, we save those. And twice a week, we do what we call a lockup day. So at the beginning of this broadcast, I was walking out to what we call the feeding site. That's where we are right now. But when I was heading out, I was heading away from our building. There is a building attached to this enclosure and that building has nice warm indoor areas for all these lemurs to stay in when it gets too cold outside or if we have something like a hurricane coming through where we're worried about them staying safe. So how do we make sure they actually go into those indoor spaces when they've got four acres of forest to explore out here? Well, we keep them on a training regimen. So twice a week, we actually will lead them inside for their food. You may have heard as we opened up this stream, there was a sound like something shaking in a bucket, kind of things knocking around. That's what we call an auditory cue. That was the keeper shaking a bucket full of biscuits to make the noise that says, hey, it's breakfast time, come and eat breakfast. And she led them out to this feeding site. But twice a week, she's actually gonna use that sound to lead them into the building. So they'll go into the building through their little lemur sized doorways, and she will feed them not just their biscuits that they're eating now, but also fruits and veggies. So those favorite parts of their diet. So they only get those parts when they're in the building, kind of like an extra treat that says, thank you so much for coming in from the forest. We know you were enjoying your time out there, but we appreciate you coming in. And that way, when we start getting really cold weather in the winter or scary stormy weather, like a hurricane coming through, we know they're reliably gonna go inside that building with us. So that's what the ring-tailed lemurs eat. And that's the same diet that we get for our red-fronted lemurs, like Red Bay here. And you'll notice that she has a bit of a limp as she's walking around. Um, don't worry about her. She's actually one of the most dominant lemurs out here. She's just an older lady. And a few years ago, she had what we think might have been a stroke. And her leg is physically just fine, but we think her brain doesn't talk to her leg as well anymore. So she can't hear, she can't feel the nerve endings quite as well, but she still manages to boss all the other lemurs around. As you see, she just went over to the food over here and one of the ring-tailed lemurs immediately hopped away. They know that she's more in charge. 
And the reason that we have the ring-tailed lemurs and red bay coming over here to steal the food from the cockerel shafak is that their diet is a little bit different. So you can see the cockerel shafak have moved over here. Didius and Gisela are up on that uh, stand over there eating out of that bowl. We have Rupert dad down here. And then over on the side, we have Furia, big sister. So ooh, I might have mixed up Furia and Giselle. I don't think I have. We'll just say that that's correct. Um, so the reason that they're all kind of moving over is because the other lemurs are trying to steal some of their food. So you can see this bowl looks very different than what we saw for the ring-tailed lemurs and the red-fronted lemurs. So in this bowl, we have another type of primate chow called folivore chow. Folivore meaning leaf eater. So cockerel shafak are very specialized eaters. They eat mostly leaves, although they do eat some vegetables and maybe even some wild fruits in Madagascar as well. But they're gonna mostly eat leaves. That's very unusual for an animal of this size. Normally, these guys are going to spend their time browsing through the trees, eating as many leaves as they can, similar to something like a rhinoceros or an elephant, something really, really large. You don't normally see animals this small eating mostly leaves because leaves are not efficient when it comes to energy. Meaning that if you eat, let's say you're eating lunch and you eat a handful of spinach, you're not gonna have a lot of energy for the rest of the day. It helps to eat things like fruits or nuts, things that are higher in sugar or protein and have lots of energy for you to use. That's why lots of small animals like squirrels eat lots of nuts and things like that because it gives them lots of energy quick. But cockerel shafak are very unique. They eat mostly leaves and veggies, and they're able to process those leaves through a very, very long digestive tract. And they need to keep eating pretty much grazing all day long so that they have enough energy to move around and to hop around through the forest. As you saw earlier, they also move in a very unique way. These guys stay vertical as they're leaping and clinging through the forest. So we call it vertical leaping and clinging. So they stay upright with their shoulders above their hips and they'll leap between the trees jumping sometimes 20, maybe even 25, 30 feet in a single bound to go from one tree to the other. And you can see that they're almost done with their breakfast. So I'll finish explaining that. So Didius was just eating a little bit of corn that was left from breakfast. Mom Gisela is now eating some of that folivore chow. That's the smaller little biscuit there. And then we have some red cabbage. I see some leftover kale and cucumber as well. So they get a variety of vegetables along with their chow every day. Now, the reason they get their veggies every day is that these guys are so specialized that we can't just give them chow. The ring-tailed lemurs are nice and hardy. They can survive with just chow and what they can find in the forest. But these cockerel shafak, they're too special. I kind of like to call them divas because they need such special care that they need that full balanced diet every single day. But then how do we convince them to come inside when we want to bring them in from the forest? Well we can switch out their protein. Today, they got beans in their food, but when they go inside, they get peanuts. And peanuts are the most coveted item for a cockerel shafak. So that's how we can make sure they wanna come inside when it's too cold or stormy outside. All right, so that was a lot of information. I wanna maybe take a pause and see if we have any questions. Absolutely, Megan, and thank you you know, for showing us a little breakfast buffet with our lemurs this morning. It's great to see them out and active and jumping around and just doing their thing. Pretty cool. Um, so those who are live in the call with us, we do have a couple of classrooms joining us. I'll just introduce them quickly. We have Mrs. Walteri's group. They are joining us from uh, Niagara Falls, Ontario, group of grade sixes. And we also have some students from Mrs. Uh, Delpino's group four fives in Thunder Bay, Ontario. There's also a big crew tuning in live via YouTube. So uh, send in questions via YouTube. I'll take some questions from there. And those in the call with me, either raise your hand virtually, so that little blue hand uh, next to your name, or send something in the chat. So first one, I have one coming in uh, here from, let's see, Jody Lynn, do you wanna turn your mic on and go ahead and ask your question? So how can you tell if a ring-tailed lemur is a female or male? So that is a great question. And I'm going to move back over to the ring-tailed lemurs to show you. So I mentioned that the red-fronted lemurs, we have one passing by there, are easy to tell apart because the colors are different. 
The ring-tailed lemurs, it is quite a bit harder. Now, with a lot of animals, even if they're the same color, you might see a difference in size between the males and the females. But with ring-tailed lemurs or any other kind of lemur, you don't even have a difference in size. So the really simple answer is that the boys and girls are gonna have different parts. So if you're looking at the lemur from behind, you'll be able to tell from that dimorphism. But the other answer is that we'll find little characteristics to show. One of the easy ways to cheat with a ring-tailed lemur let me see if I can find our dad, Randy, in the group and show you. If I'm guessing correctly, he's eating on his own since he is not trying to get kicked off of his food by one of his daughters or his female. Oop, ran into a tree. Nope, he is eating with one of his daughters. Right here. So on the right, we have Randy. He's the one who stayed put when I came over. And it's probably really hard for you to see, but right on his shoulder, kind of near the front, of his chest, he has a little black spot, right where the white kind of starts. It's a little hard to see. And he's also got black spots on the insides of his wrist. Oh, he's doing some scent marking for you right now. That's cool to see. So he has special scent glands on his wrists and his inner shoulder that the females don't have. So if we see a male ringtail walking around, we should be able to see a black spot kind of on the inside of his shoulder and a larger black spot on the inside of his kind of wrist elbow area. Those are special scent glands he has for doing something really fun that we call stink fighting, where he pulls his tail in front, rubs it with those scent glands and makes sure it smells really stinky, just like him. And then he'll wave at another, another male ring tail to compete for females and compete for territory. I'm not kidding. It's literally called stink fighting. That's a real term in research. So that was my long answer to your question. I hope that helps. All right. Very cool. Let's grab a question from online here. Let's see. Um, so I'm going to do a, throw a two-parter at you. One's from Gil and Gil wants to know how many lemurs are at the center. And then Nikki wants to know if the species always get along or there's some that you have to keep separate. Those are both excellent questions. So we have over 200 lemurs living here at the Duke Lemur Center. And that is the most lemurs with the most diversity of species because we have 14 different species of lemur living here that you're gonna find anywhere outside of Madagascar. And the second question is one of my favorites. How do we make sure that they get along? Well, it has to do sometimes with the species and other times with the individuals. So we have to look at kind of all the personalities. And I like to say that the curator just has a giant puzzle to solve because we don't have enough room for everybody to live in the forest um, because we just don't have that much acreage around us. We also have to make sure that every lemur who lives out in the forest has three basic rules that they can follow. One is that they have to be in good enough health that they can be going up 60, 70 feet into trees and we don't have to worry about them losing their balance or falling or anything like that. So some of our more elderly lemurs aren't able to free range just to keep them safe because lemurs here live 10, maybe even 20 years longer than they would out in the wild since they get so spoiled. The other thing we have to make sure is that we have to be sure that they are going to listen to that training and they are going to come when they call and that uh, they are gonna come inside when she gives them fruit on those special days or when it gets too cold out or when there's hurricanes. And then the last thing is they have to be friendly lemurs to each other and they have to be okay with me standing around. You'll notice I've been getting pretty close within a few feet of these guys with my camera and standing near them. And some of them move politely away, but some will stay put, but they don't interact with me like they do with each other. That's a really, really important thing. We don't want the lemurs to be friendly towards people, but we do want them to mostly ignore us. That's a great thing when they're out in the forest. And of course they have to be friendly with each other. So as a general rule, the cockerel shafak who are across the way there and the ring-tailed lemurs here, they get along really well in the forest. Cause as I said, they occupy different levels of the forest. They're not usually competing for where they want to hang out. On the other hand, oh, we have an intruder joining our cast. There's a squirrel coming in to steal some of the food. They can cause problems sometimes. They don't always get along with the lemurs. Believe it or not, the lemurs can be scared off their food by the squirrels. Doesn't matter that they're much smaller. So over here, we have our red-fronted lemurs. There's Red Bay right there. So they can only get along with certain groups out here. As I mentioned, they're very dominant. They kind of rule the roost out here. For some reason, they get along really well with this ring-tailed lemur troop. The ring-tails seem to let them hang out with them and actually boss them around a little bit it probably would be really hard to put these red-fronted lemurs 
out into a forest with a really dominant species, like say the red ruffed lemurs or the black and white ruffed lemurs, they're known for being a bit more bullish out here, a bit more of bullies as they come out. So it is dependent on the species and the individuals. Um, and we kind of have to know them really well to know who's gonna get along. And I won't lie to you, sometimes they try it out and it just doesn't work. They try a new species in a forest and they figure out, you know what, this isn't gonna be good for everybody. And then they go back to the drawing board and try again. All right, uh, Mrs. Delpino, I see you typed a question in. Do you wanna unmute your mic and ask it? Sure. One of the striped tails looks like it has an elastic in halfway through it. Why is it like that? Thank you for pointing that out. So that is actually what we call a tail shave. So we've actually, what we've done is actually shaved around that spot on the tail because as I mentioned earlier, ring-tailed lemurs look really similar, even the boys and the girls. So that's an easy way for us to tell who is who in that family. So we use tail shaves all the time. It's kind of like getting a funny haircut. They don't mind it at all. And especially when we are not shut down because of COVID-19, we have researchers out here who follow them in the forest. And if they're up high in a tree, that tail shave can help us tell who's who and who's doing what behavior. Great question. All right. Uh, let's grab one more from, yeah, come in, bud. We have another joiner for the event, wants to see the lemurs. Come on in, Finn. <laughs> There he is. Okay, uh, let's see. I'll grab another one from YouTube. Um, okay, so you mentioned, there's a few questions about the predators of, of lemurs and you mentioned uh, the FUSA earlier and the YouTube crew is curious about the FUSA. Can you tell us a little bit about them? I sure can. I happen to love carnivores. So you guys have opened Pandora's box here. So FUSA are very much like lemurs. They are super specialized to the island of Madagascar. FUSA, um, their ancestors arrived a couple tens of millions of years later than lemurs on the island. And they evolved to be very, very good lemur predators. FUSA, their family is most closely related to the mongoose family. So very, very old types of carnivores. They have a pointy narrow face and they stand I'd say about as tall as maybe a bobcat, if that's a reference that I think hopefully most of the North Americans can get. Um, so they're, I think probably around 15 to 25 pounds. Hopefully I'm not getting that horribly wrong. And basically they are carnivores that can climb trees very well. They're kind of a rusty brown color. They blend in with the trees and they can climb trees up with their claws and they also can rotate their back feet all the way around backwards so they can climb down trees successfully without having to jump. So that means even if a lemur is up in a tree, a fusa could go up there. But fusa do best on the ground. So that's why most lemurs don't spend that much time on the ground because they're really vulnerable down there. They're also, um, depending on what size of lemur you are, can be additional predators. Um, and they're even could be the threat of another lemur. There is a type of mouse lemur, the giant mouse lemur, that has been documented eating smaller species of mouse lemur, which is pretty crazy. Um, so lemurs are pretty opportunistic. And so that giant mouse lemur has been observed eating other little lemurs. Um, but mostly the predator they have to worry about is the fusa, sometimes a big bird of prey or a big constricting snake, but that's more of a threat if you're a tiny mouse lemur or fat-tailed dwarf lemur. All right, so Megan, we take a little pause here. If you want to share a little more with us, then we can jump back into the Q&A action. Yeah, that sounds great. So I guess since we're looking at Didius right now, let's talk about babies. Um, so babies here at the Duke Lemur Center are very, very important. Um, we have what's called a genetic safety net that we form with all of the babies we have born here. But we're very, very particular about how many babies we try to have every year. We work with an organization called the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and they are most active in North America, but they also work with the European Association and the World Association. And basically, it's a bunch of different places like the Duke Lemur Center, the San Diego Zoo, um, places like the Toronto Zoo, and they all get together and they work on what's called a breeding plan. So they have a breeding plan that says, okay, we have this many lemurs, and these lemurs 
we have records going all the way back to the wild of how they're related. Think of like a stud book in horse racing. We have the same thing for lemurs. And so Didius was a planned baby because we know that Gisela and her mate Rupert's genetics are really, really good. And we knew that we would have space for Didius as he was growing up here. What we didn't want to do, even though baby lemurs are very cute, is to just say, okay, baby lemurs are cute. Let's have as many as we can. So what we did is we planned it very carefully and little Didius is doing very, very well. I mentioned that he's about five months old and I made a joke earlier about him being a little big for riding on mom. Uh, Furia, his big sister, I actually was here when she was this age and she had already been kicked off of mom's back. Mom said it was a hot summer. She was a later baby and she didn't want Furia riding around on her back anymore. So she actually would kind of nip at Furia's fingers when she tried to ride on her back and said, no, no, you're okay. You're going to be on your own now. She's being a little more patient with Didius. And I know that sounds really harsh for her to nip at their fingers, but that's how the babies grow and get bigger and get stronger. I have seen Didius move around through the trees here. Even when he was only, I'd say a month old, um, even two months old, he was able to hop around and move around in this forest. He was up in the trees playing. So they get very, very strong, very, very quickly because in the wild, they have to, they can't ride around on mom forever. Although as you can see, he is hitching a free ride for as long as he can. Oh, and my favorite thing we can see right now, I call this the cinnamon bun. If you can see it, where Didius's tail is curled up underneath him. Oh, he just sat on it. Not helpful. Um, Gisela's is doing it a little bit here too. Their tails aren't prehensile like a monkey. They can't use it like an extra arm. But for some reason, Shafak tend to curl up their tail like a little roll whenever they're not using it and they want it to stay out of their way. That's one of my favorite things about watching them is seeing that little cinnamon bun. Do we have any other questions or should I keep jabbering about lemurs? Oh, no, we can definitely grab more questions. There's lots coming in on YouTube. Uh, to the groups who are with us in the call, don't be shy. Use the chat or raise your hand virtually. But I do want to check in because we do have a couple family groups mixed in too. So I want to check in uh, with our group from Concord, North Carolina. If you have a question, go ahead and turn on your microphone. And also we have our group, where's the other one? In Durham, North Carolina with Hannah. Hannah, if you have a question, go ahead and turn your microphone on about the lemurs. All right, maybe they're being a bit shy. So let's go with Lennon. I see Lennon has his hand up. Um, out of the 200 lemurs, are there any different kinds of lemurs in your forest? Yeah, absolutely. So we tend to have three or four different species in each of our forests, and we have nine different forest habitats. So most of the forests, if not all, it might be all, have these guys, the cockerel shafak and the ring-tailed lemurs, since I mentioned they are such good pals out in the forest and do really well sharing the space. And then we usually have one or two other species. That currently includes blue-eyed black lemurs, red ruffed lemurs, black and white ruffed lemurs, collared lemurs, and red fronted lemurs. We've also had, oh, and mongoose lemurs. So we do have quite a few other species of lemur. The only ones you're not going to see out free ranging in the forest are the nocturnal lemurs, since it's not quite as easy to take care of them out here. And other ones like our mouse lemurs would be very, very hard to keep track of, and our normal fence would not keep those tiny guys in. All right, Albert, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Um, what is your favorite lemur? Ooh, my favorite lemur is one we're not going to see today, but I hope we'll do a program on in the future. It's the eye eye. So the eye eye is a very unusual lemur. It's the largest nocturnal primate in the world, and I could literally talk for hours about them. But uh, the way it's spelled is A-Y-E dash A-Y-E, and they're super unusual and unique and weird, and I highly recommend looking them up if you haven't heard of them. Uh, absolutely, I second that. They are so cool looking, and with their that one long skinny finger for tapping on trees and listening for grubs, really cool. Um, so I did get a question just sent from um, our group in Concord, and they're wondering, 
if Madagascar, if Madagascar is the only spot that you can find lemurs in the wild, and if so, uh, why? So I have a tendency to answer questions in a really long way, so I'll try to keep this brief, but it's, it's a bit of a long answer. So the first part, yes, you can find lemurs in the wild in a couple other places called the Comoros Islands. And if you look at a map of the world and you look where Madagascar is, in between Madagascar's northern edge and Africa, the mainland of Africa, you'll see some little islands there. Those are the Comoros Islands. And lemurs have been introduced to those islands now for enough time that they are naturalized. And some species do live there. I know notably the mongoose lemurs do, and I think a couple of smaller species do, but they didn't evolve on that island. They were introduced a little bit later, we think possibly by human activity near that island. Um, the reason that you only find lemurs in this part of the world is actually something that my colleague, Dr. Matt Borths, covers really well in one of our older videos. So I would recommend checking that out if you want a little more detail. It should be on our playlist on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants page. Um, but basically, long, long time ago, about 60 million years ago, there were little lemur-like primates actually in North America, near what is present-day Wyoming. We've actually found evidence of them there. And from what we can tell from the fossil evidence we can find, at some point in history, little lemur-like primates managed to get all the way over into Africa. And then to get from Africa to Madagascar, they rafted most likely on some vegetation that had been knocked over by storms or something like that. And they just accidentally wound up at the island. This was a very, very happy accident for them though, because on mainland Africa, soon after that, monkeys and apes started to evolve. And monkeys and apes were much, much better at surviving in Africa, especially because predators were evolving to eat those animals in Africa. So there are only a few of those really early lemur-like primates that would still be left today. Um, some distant relatives in the prosimian, meaning pre-monkey, or strepsirine, which is a bit of a fancier, more accurate term, primates. Those guys are gonna be the bush babies in Africa or the lorises in Asia. And you'll notice they're small and they're nocturnal. They stay out of everybody else's way and they don't really have many resources to spare. Whereas the lemurs in Madagascar, their ancestors accidentally got to a little lemur paradise where there were no predators and no other primates to bother them for tens of millions of years. So that's why this one giant island is home to over 100 species of lemur today. All right, I'm gonna slide over to you two because you have a few more questions that have come through. Uh, Margaret is wondering about the noises the lemurs make and what are some of the purposes? Is it mating, eating, calling for young? So the noises they make can depend a lot on the species and the situation. The main way that most lemurs are going to communicate when they're up close to each other is through body language and through actions that they take with one another. Animals tend to rely a lot less on vocalization than we do. And sorry, I was listening to see if I was hearing a lemur noise behind me, but it was a squirrel talking, not a lemur. Um, so these guys are going to spend more of their time close to each other communicating with those kind of behavioral things, things they do in front of each other. When they're vocalizing, it very much depends on the species. They do have lots of different calls they can make. Um, there is a call that the Shafak make that is actually the reason for their name. So. I do a decent interpretation of it so I can try for you guys, but basically they do a little call to check in with each other. And especially if one of them gets a little lost and wants to find the rest of their family, they'll do a little Shafak call. And it sounds like, <laughs> oh, she deleted it. So you can see Gisela looked over. Um, so it kind of sounds like they're saying Shafaka, Shafaka. And that's how they got their name. Um, they also have an alarm call that they can do. Now, the most famous alarm call is by the rough lemurs. Their alarm call can be heard a half a mile away. It's very, very noisy. Um, you can definitely look it up online um, if you want to hear um, how loud that call gets. Um, these guys, when they do an alarm call, I like to joke that it sounds like a goose honking. So it's kind of a loud honking noise they do. And that alarm call is a thing you'll hear in a lot of social animals, especially social prey animals that says, hey, I think I saw something fly overhead or I saw something scary on the ground. Everybody be on the alert. So every lemur species has different little calls, but every one of them definitely has an alarm call. All right. 
Mrs. Gualteri, I know you have a question. Do you want to go ahead and unmute your mic? Uh, yes. Um, I'm not sure if it was mentioned already, but uh, how have they been selected to be at this center? And um, are many of them rescued? So, excellent question. I haven't covered this yet. So all of the lemurs you're meeting today were born here at the center or at another zoo or facility like us through that breeding program. When the lemur center was first started back in 1966, they started with an effort to bring lemurs over from the wild in Madagascar. Um, there also were some lemurs in the original founding population that uh, the researcher who founded it already had living in North America. But basically they pulled some lemurs out of the wild. Oh, there goes Gisela, which means the Didius is probably going to follow. So basically, they pulled some lemurs out of the wild and brought them here to North America to help us establish that breeding population. One really important thing I want to point out is that we have not brought any lemurs out of the wild in Madagascar since 1991, I believe, possibly 92. And that's because at that point in history, we decided that it was too much of a negative bringing lemurs out of the wild that outweighed the positive of having the genetic safety net here in North America. Now the upside for all of the lemurs living here, and I just realized they all left me, so I'm gonna focus over here. Um, the upside for them is that they get to live here where there are no predators, there are no illnesses they have to worry about since we have a full-time veterinary team. They tend to live twice or maybe three times as long as their wild counterparts, mm -hmm. but part of our responsibility, since we pulled lemurs out of the wild, is that we then have to make sure we make their life just as enriching. So that's why we have these big forested habitats. The lemurs who can't live in the forest get lots of enrichment, lots of toys and things provided for them. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of a complicated question, but I hope that answered it. All right. So we've got a question that's come in from Maimuna online, and they're wondering about uh, a famous lemur, Zabumafu, if Zabumafu came from Madagascar or from the Duke Lemur Center. So the main lemur who played Zabu, Zabumafu, on the show with the Crap Brothers that I definitely grew up watching um, was actually a lemur named Jovian. And he did live here at the Duke Lemur Center. He was born here. We actually were the first facility to successfully breed Cockerel Shafak like Jovian here. And I can't remember exactly how Gisela is related to him, but I know she is. So Zabu or Jovian as we knew him was a very, very important lemur. He had really important genetics. So he's got kids and grandkids all over the Duke Lemur Center. So I like to joke that if you pick a Cockerel Shafak family living here, that one of them is definitely related to Jovian. All right, very cool. Uh, let's see. So Jody is curious, you mentioned that the young one on uh, mom's back, uh, Didian, was a bit old to be doing that. When would they normally become more independent? Sure, so normally it depends on the mom. So it can be six months, even a little longer, seven or eight months. But in my personal experience here, Gisela is not as patient of a mom. And as I mentioned, she kicked Furia off at only four months old. Um, so six months is not unusual. I was just surprised because I know Gisela and I know that she's not always the most patient mom. Gotcha. More of a, a uh, just knowing her habits. Mm -hmm. So one more question from online here. Danielle is wondering how you divide the forest up and do the fences have to be really high because, you know, the lemurs can get pretty high up in the treetops. That is a great question. And, um, I'm going to step over this way to actually show you. I'll switch my view because the lemurs, now that they've had breakfast, have actually gone back inside their indoor areas because it's hot out here. So we're going to talk about the fence line over here. So here you can see the fence isn't all that tall. Here I can flip it around so you can see it in comparison to me. Um, and for those of us in the US, I am five foot four. I do not know that in meters, um, but basically you can see it's not all that tall. We're getting up to over six feet with the net at the top. The reason that it works is because we know how lemurs loop. So lemurs will either leap across to different trees or they will leap up to a tree. They're not gonna leap up and over something. So what we do is we have a net across the top of this fence 
and it has a little electrical electrical pulse that runs through it. Nothing that would really harm them, but enough that it feels weird to touch it. And so they learn, oop, don't touch the net. Now they can touch anything below there. I can touch this and I'm fine. But if I were to touch that net, that's when I'd feel that little jolt. So you'll see the lemurs hopping along the fence all the time. The other thing we do is we keep the trees cut back. Now you can see our lower vegetation has gotten a little longer, but all of this is muscadine grapevine, which is here for those who are curious, they like to eat this. Um, or we have some honeysuckle that is growing here. None of this is really substantial stuff they can climb on and stay on. All the trees, the bigger trees, are at least 10 feet back from the fence. And you can see there's an additional corridor here and then there's an additional 10 feet on the other side. So I'm in natural habitat enclosure number two and right over there is natural habitat enclosure number one. And you can see there's so much space in between the trees on either side that the lemurs aren't able to climb up and over because of the net and they're not able to leap up and over because of those trees. All right. So maybe we'll take one or two more questions from our groups live in the call from our camera group. So if you do have another question, you can uh, either put, raise your hand virtually or give me a wave. I'm doing a quick scan through the students to see maybe if someone couldn't find uh, the option to raise your hand. So you can give me a wave if you have another question. All right, well, let's grab, doesn't look like it. So I'm gonna grab one more here via YouTube. So let's see. Um, okay, here's one, sleeping. How uh, much do lemurs sleep on average? Um, so that's an interesting question because it might be a little different between here and in the wild. And I'm actually really quick, I'm gonna change where I'm standing. I mentioned that the lemurs had gone inside. So I'm gonna show you how they get out into the forest so I can explain where I'm going and then I'll finish talking about sleeping. So right here is the entrance and you can see the forest is all around us. And then right here is where the lemurs can get into their winter housing or their outdoor indoor housing. So as soon as they ate their food, the lemurs decided that they would rather hang out in here than the four acres of forest. Don't worry, they'll get back out there soon to go foraging and eating more food. But right now we've got the family hanging out in here. So you can see they're taking a little bit of a rest after being out in the forest. And again, there's that open door. The forest is waiting for them if they wanna go back. So you can see that everybody's hanging out and they're probably gonna groom each other a bit and then take a nap for a little while. Lemurs do nap quite a bit throughout the day, especially when it gets really, really hot outside. They're not dumb, just like us. They're not gonna stay outside if they don't have to, especially when they have these fun little lemur doors that take them into a nice little indoor area with a nice big fan blowing on them. So they are gonna spend a lot of time inside on really hot days. But for the most part, these lemurs that live out in the forest are diurnal. They are going to sleep overnight. So that'll vary a little bit depending on how much night we have, depending on the time of year. But just because they're supposed to sleep at night doesn't mean that they don't nap quite a bit during the day. I don't know the exact hours of sleep for each type of lemur. It probably varies a bit between the different lemurs, but I'm guessing that they probably nap a bit more here than they do in Madagascar because they don't have to spend as much time foraging for food since it got delivered in a silver bowl this morning. All right, fair enough. Well, I want to start off by giving a huge shout out to the YouTube uh, community that joined us today. Thank you for sending in so many great questions and joining us. I want to give a huge shout out um, to our classrooms uh, and family groups that joined us live on camera today. Thank you for sending in some great questions. And Megan, a huge shout out uh, to you and everybody at the Duke Lemur Center. We're loving our Thursday morning events and today was another fun one. Absolutely. This has been really fun for me, especially being shut down to the public right now. It's really fun to get to teach people about lemurs again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I do want to make a quick announcement before we sign off for today. We've got one more event today at one o'clock Eastern. We're going to go live on the American Prairie Reserve uh, with Danny Kinka, and we're going to go to a prairie dog colony. So we're going to learn a little bit about the grassland ecosystem and then hopefully check out some prairie dogs. So if anyone wants to tune into our YouTube channel at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's what we are up to. All right. Well, again, Megan, a huge thank you. Thank you so much for sharing some of that knowledge with us today. Thanks for introducing us to so many cool lemur species. And I'm going to get the students to turn on their microphones if they want to, and they can do a big goodbye and thank you. So if you guys want to unmute your mics and you want to say thank you, you can go ahead. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. All right, You're Megan. Welcome. Thank you so much for another fun event today. 
Thanks, guys. See you soon.